Next on Viewpoint. You can't perceive the fact that the enemy is coming after you. Is there a war going on for our spirit? I think the church is never more incapacitated and ineffective when we're following culture. Is there still a place for the neighborhood church? And later, a new book says if men can give one hour a day, their lives will be changed. This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. Spiritual warfare is a topic mentioned in the Bible. It's been the subject of many books and also a few movies, but are we getting the wrong idea about what spiritual warfare is and how to fight it? Bishop Ronald Hill is pastor of Love and Unity Fellowship in Compton, California. He's got a radio and a TV show, and he also served two tours of duty in Vietnam. So warfare is something he's uniquely familiar with. And uh, Bishop Hill, we are glad to have you with us today. Well, I'm glad to be with you today. Uh, we, we talk about spiritual warfare, and you're also the, uh, the, we're the evangelist and chaplain of the Los Angeles County uh, Probation uh, Department. Uh, what is spiritual warfare? Well, I also may add that uh, one of the, the greatest opportunities I had to see uh, spiritual warfare up close and personal, uh, I worked on Skid Row uh, at a place called Union Rescue Mission in downtown Los Angeles uh, for wow. six plus years, 40 hours a week. And I dealt with a lot of issues in terms of uh, spiritual warfare there. And plus working in the jail system, uh, the Los Angeles County Jail and the juvenile system in Southern California as well. Now, there are people out there who are watching right now who don't understand what we're talking about when we talk about spiritual warfare. Uh, they hear about spirits, they hear about the Holy Spirit, but explain, explain to our audience what spiritual warfare really is and, and what would they see if they saw that going on in their own lives? Well, they see it going on in their own lives, whether they like it or not. Every day, we have to deal with spirits. Every day, Satan will bring a notion or an idea to our minds seeking to lure us away from uh, walking with God. It's a very solar thing oftentimes. Uh, and if, you're not, uh, if your mind hasn't been renewed, if you're not exposing yourself to the word of God and the spirit of God, you can't perceive the fact that the enemy is coming after you. I, I found out that in spiritual warfare, Satan comes through, through three primary avenues, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. He'll come through those avenues and he'll offer you something that appears to be in your favor, but all the time is coming to disrupt you, disrupt you or to destroy you. So that's spiritual warfare, being able to detect and reject, being able to detect when, when the spirit of the enemy is speaking to you and then have the courage and the faith and the scriptural knowledge to reject it. So basically, in my mind, that's what spiritual warfare is. It's recognizing the presence of the enemy and then using your, your faith and biblical principles to ward it off. If it's that pervasive, I mean, should we walk around being afraid of spirits all the time? Or how do we, how do we in our everyday life, uh, realize this and, and challenge it? Well, no, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't look for a demon up on the every rock. However, I am very vigilant. Uh, I, I believe that the Bible tells us to watch and pray. And I don't, I don't believe that we should be necessarily afraid of, of a demon being around every corner. However, when the enemy comes after you, you'll know it. You don't have to look for it. it will, they will find you. And when they find you and you recognize that they're talking to you, and, and again, they will always come to lure us away from our steadfastness in God. That's the way to detect them. They will come usually to lie to you about God. The first thing they want to do is to dislodge you from God. They come to lie to you about God. Then once they've lied to you about God, then they begin to lie to you about people and life in general. And then they take you on the path of destruction. So you have to watch to make sure that when he enters into your mind, you detect it and reject it. Well, this, this is warfare, so be, before detecting it and rejecting it, what, what, what are the weapons of our warfare? What do we use? I believe that what we need to do is prepare ourselves uh, for the war. Uh, when I, before I went to Vietnam, they took me through basic training. They trained me. They got me ready to be a, a seller on this particular ship. They gave me a job to do. I had a job description. I learned what my, my responsibilities were, and I was ready to carry that out as soon as we got into a war zone. So then, obviously, we were not in a war zone continuously. There were times when we would be in a war zone. Other times, 
we'd be in rest and relaxation. But I had to be trained. And I, and I believe that Christians need to be trained to do warfare. They need to be trained to, to walk by faith. They need to be trained to keep their hopes and dreams of, for God uh, uh, current. And they need to walk in the love of God. And to know that Satan will come to attack that. So spiritual warfare has much to do with trust in the gospel, depending on the power of the Holy Spirit, and agreeing with the word of God. And anything that will attack those three is issues in your life, you reject it by faith in Jesus' name. So we, so we have in this warfare, we have both defensive weapons or defensive armor, and we've got offensive weapons. Is that right? That's exactly right. We, we have actually, we have one offensive weapon, which is the word of God, but everything else is for defense. Like in sports, you never hear anybody at the basketball game yelling offense, offense. They <laughs> always yell defense, 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 because if you can't play defense, you can't win. And many That's Christians right. aren't winning because they don't know how to play defense in the spiritual arena. Well, Satan's going to be very, I mean, he's, he's going to be very deceptive. He's not going to come at you with horns on. He's going to be very deceptive. Uh, how, do we, how do we determine that it really is spiritual warfare? How do we determine that it's the enemy coming after us? Well, how do we know that? Yeah, we know that because, first of all, uh, we know it because Satan himself became drunk on pride. Pride was the original problem. He became intoxicated with his own pride. He sought to overthrow God, and he was summarily uh, kicked out of the realm of heaven. And he brought that same mentality into the Garden of Eden. He brought the idea, I want to be in charge. So the fallen nature of a man desires to be God. There is a God syndrome in every human being, and every human being wants to be in charge. And so when we repent of our sins and accept Christ as our Savior, we are putting ourselves under the tutelage of God. We're coming under the Lordship of God, and we allow him to be our Savior, our Lord, and our Master. So when Satan comes against us, he always comes to, to, to lure us into getting out from under the control of God. Adam and Eve were doing fine as long as they were under the control of God. And we can do fine as Christians as long as we are under the control of God. But once we decide to go off on our own, and we decide that because Satan comes to lure us into it. He comes to tempt us to go our own way. And when we bite into that temptation, that's when we fail. But when we, re when we recognize the temptation and reject the temptation, that's when we win. Yeah. Well, you'd mentioned that the Bible is our main offensive weapon. Uh, there's people out there right now going through some of this, this torment, some of this, they, they feel that they're in spiritual warfare. Is there any spe special places in the Bible that they need to go to to really arm themselves? Well, I think, again, one of the most important, uh, one of the, some of the most important information that a Christian must have if they desire to defeat the enemy. Having a working knowledge of the gospel is paramount. You've got to know that you are no longer a sinner. You've got to know that Christ's blood has redeemed you and that you have been regenerated by the Spirit of God, number one. And number two, you have to know that everything you need to be fulfilled in this life comes from God. Now, when you're armed with that information that Jesus is Savior and that he desires to be Lord and Master, then you get into the scriptures and any uh, statement or any word or any notion that comes to your mind that is anti-Bible, it is up to you to reject it and replace it with the Word of God. Uh, when Jesus came under attack, what he did was he used Scripture. Uh, Satan spoke to him and Jesus responded by what is written. So as Christians, we must be able to respond to the attacks of the devil that comes to our mind, by the way, with, 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 with what is written. We got to respond to what is written and agree with what is written instead of agreeing with the madness that comes into our mind. Now, there are people out there right now that uh, they feel like they're being pursued in one area of their life. It may just be one thing that, that's almost carried over from their, their family history. Is there such a thing as generational spirits? I believe that they are. I, matter of fact, I'm sure that they are. There are certain families uh, uh, that, that everybody in the family uh, either are dealing with drugs and alcohol. Uh, I, I'm, I've known families 
that just about everybody in there was violent. Uh, I had some cousins, um, unfortunately, that every one of them except one committed a murder. They were just a mean spirited people. And I believe that it's a generational curse that comes down from one generation to the other generation through the spiritual arena. And so that's why it's so, again, necessary to, to get extracted from those uh, spirits is to be born again out of it and then learn how to stand your ground with the scriptures and with faith so that you won't be controlled by the same spirit. So we don't need to walk around being afraid. We don't need to walk around with our, you know, all covered up and, and worried about who's going to attack us next. We need to go forth with a lot of hope as long as we're armed with the gospel. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because God has not given us a spirit of fear. And, you know, dear brother, I must tell you that I think that uh, once an individual is born again and, and, and began to know who he is in Christ, spiritual defense should be one of the main lessons that he learns. Because there are evil spirits out there, plus the world system is out there that is controlled by demonic power, plus we are living in a physical body that is anti-God, a physical body, according to the scriptures, is not subject to the laws of God, neither indeed can be. So we have a formidable enemy to deal with. And this is the reason why, again, we must be full of faith in the word of God, full of hope in God and understand that we are at war. We are soldiers in the arms of the Lord. But we're dealing with this war from a, a standpoint of victory and not from a standpoint that we're trying to gain the victory. Uh, we already have the victory. The moment you repent of your sins and the moment you accept Christ as your Savior, you gain the victory immediately. But you have to learn how to walk in it. And you have to learn how to walk in faith, learn how to trust the Word of God. And you can win every time, not sometime, but you can win every time. Coming up, with churches becoming larger and more diverse, is there still a place for the neighborhood church? And later, a new book says if men can give one hour a day, their lives will be changed. Church attendance has dropped nationally, and online churches are on the rise. What's the role of the American church in our current culture, and what makes a healthy church, or do we even need brick and mortar anymore? And Pastor, Pastor Branham's with me today again. Glad to have Hello. you back. Good to be back. Uh, you're a pastor of a local church, brick and mortar church, and in a lot of areas in the United States, people have kind of left the buildings. They're watching on TV, or they've just left altogether. What do you think the, the phenomenon is, is, what's caused it? Yeah, I think, Bob, our culture is, uh, there's a lot of consumerism. That is, I'm going to find what pleases me and what fits mm -hmm. me, and then I'm just, uh, everyone's attracted to that because it's meeting my wants and needs. So I think there's, there's a lot of that that's kind of feeding into this whole, you know, mass exodus right. out of brick and mortar churches and fellowship. So that, that's probably yeah. part of it. Well, when, when you go to a, I mean, people want to be, like you say, this consumerism. I, I yes. go to a, a Chinese restaurant, I expect egg rolls and whatever else they sell in Chinese restaurants. Yeah. Italian food, I want, I want pasta. And so you, you, you start, to, people start to look for churches that kind of meet my own personal needs and I'm looking to be served rather than to serve. Yeah, I, I would definitely say that. Uh, one thing, here's one thing, though, about the gospel is that it has a tremendous ability to adapt to the culture. Jesus said that uh, the gospel is like leaven. And so leaven gets into something small and it, and it goes mm -hmm. throughout the, the bread or whatever. And, and the gospel has the ability to do the same thing. However, to, to what you're saying, I think the church is never more uh, incapacitated and ineffective when we're following culture. When we're, when we're trying to uh, uh, keep up with the culture. I think we're really, we become anemic when we're, we're trying to just keep up with the culture. So we're trying, yeah, trying to mimic, on, yeah. trying to attract people through that. Mm -hmm. I think that we need to be who we are. Right. Yeah, and, and yeah, if there's, a, if there's a real reason for brick and mortar, to add a, a youth building or something like that to attract more, that, that, that's great, but that, that, that vision should come from, from from a lot of prayer and, and, and from the, the you know, people of God is they, they say, God, what do you want us to do with this money? Do we send it to Somalia or do we build this youth center? I mean, they, they really ought to know where that money is going and why, why they're building what they're building rather than just the building. That's right. I, I think maybe we kind of get into this mindset that we've always got to be growing bigger yeah. right where we're at. But 
or we're going to lose. Or we're going to lose, mm -hmm. right? That that's not always the case. Where are we investing? Where where else can we grow? Right. And and that may be in foreign missions. Is there still a place for the the neighborhood church around the corner? I mean, the the, the, the church that my my uncles built and the whole family went there, and and uh, we and it was like a family reunion on Sunday morning. That church does. In in my life, uh, that church is gone now. It doesn't doesn't even exist. Is there still room for that church? I think there is, and I think we're actually going to be seeing a turn back to that, albeit not completely the same. I think we're going to see that neighborhood churches are important because, as you've pointed out, they, they know what the neighborhood's about. They, can, they possess the DNA of that neighborhood. We even see this in missions now. Missiologists or those that study missions are telling us that it... In, you probably know when you were young, you know, there's a call for missions. We, you know, yes. be a missionary and mm -hmm. all these things. That's, that's changing because what we're finding is to be an effective missionary, you have to send a native. You have to yeah. send a local, mm -hmm. right? So if, if you have a white man going to a majority brown skin area, they, they aren't as quick to listen to them. Right. So we're, we're doing more in missions now where we're sending people to train and to, uh, to develop itinerant missionaries right or that's right the passes, native the, na the native, native missions native that's correct missions. yeah so we hopefully i mean is that is that neighborhood church maybe survives that out of that we'll we'll see we'll see more missions <laughs> yeah and, and even if you know and even if you know the the local church building doesn't mm -hmm. survive and, and there's no church there god is just god's going to be raising up house churches i think because yeah. because there probably is some deficiency that people are finding in some of these other expressions of the church so when you look at the, the, the growth of small groups, and you got the big mega church, and then and most churches are trying to sm start small groups that meet separately from the church, maybe in the church or somebody's home. Is that, a, is that an effort to compensate for the loss of the, the neighborhood church? Yeah, I, I believe that it is. You know, with, with, with yeah. such a large group, you've got to have these pockets to develop real relationships. Right. In. And, and I think small accountability. groups... Accountability. Mm -hmm. Small groups foster that. To, and, and, you know, the, one of the buzzwords now is community. Mm -hmm. Are you developing community? And, and that's because, you know, if you're bringing in people, you know, larger churches uh, typically attract people from, from great distances. Well, right. yeah. when, you're, when your life outside of church is lived so far away from where you're, you're going to church, mm -hmm. you can't develop those things. So, yeah, I, I would say that, that part of small groups sure. is to develop that community feel. So we've got these small groups and we can develop this relationship, but there are people who kind of, I don't want to get involved with other people. I'm, I'm, I'm fearful, I'm afraid. So they, do, they, do they move to the, the internet or to online churches because oh, I can get my fix, I can, get, I, can, I can feel really good about it, I can listen to great music, I can get the word of God into me, I can study with somebody, but I don't have to relate to anybody. You think people are moving to, because they're afraid? They're, they're afraid of the relationship, yeah. afraid to get hurt? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, that people are, they're not wanting to take the risk of developing relationships because they've been hurt, right? They, they've either they've, by they, church or by people in the by church. By people or? in the church, you know, national leaders maybe that have fallen, yeah. whatever that is, right? It's it's easier mm -hmm. to just watch someone on TV because you don't have to have a relationship or, or you know your computer or tablet. You don't have to develop a relationship with that pe person. You just get fed and then you turn it off and that's it. And what what are they what are they losing at that point? I mean, what yeah, is, what what happens when they turn the TV off? What the, they they are. We're going to become a spiritually deficient society if we aren't developing relationships. Mm -hmm. If if I'm only watching TV, guess what I don't have? You said it several times. I don't have accountability. Mm -hmm. I don't have that outside perspective of someone telling me, hey, you know what? It looks like you're struggling in this area. Can I, can I help you? Can mm -hmm. I pray for you? Y you lose all of that. And, and I am convinced, and this is not just because I'm a pastor, I am convinced that you cannot be you cannot have a Christian life that is vibrant and healthy unless you are in direct, regular contact with other believers, mm -hmm. a.k.a. church. Church. But it, 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 is it okay to do, to do both? I've got my church, I've got my church family, but I really enjoy, in my case, Francis Chan, <laughs> and I'm going to watch him on YouTube. Uh, is, that, is that healthy? I mean, is it kind of a supplement to my, my, my church life? I think it's just that. I think it should be a supplement, right? And, and I absolutely think that you should do that. I do that. Listen, mm -hmm. we have, I believe that, that Christianity has some of the best speakers worldwide, has yeah. some of the most encouraging. We have the greatest message of all time. Absolutely. And, and have some of the, the greatest deliverers of that message. So we, we need to 
uh, take, uh, take, partake of that. Right. We need to we need to listen to that. Mm -hmm. I think that it definitely needs to be a supplement. However, I think priority needs to be the local church. Right. Uh, we need to be giving first to our local church, and then we can we can give in offerings to those. But yeah, I definitely think we need to. For more interviews on demand, plus additional resources from today's guests, go to WTLW.com and click on the Viewpoint tab. You can also like and share us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. The Bible is the centerpiece of our faith, yet many people debate its accuracy, and if it can really be taken literally. John Michael Stubbins is with us today. He's with Prelude Publishing. They're challenging men to take a 30-day challenge to make the Bible a central part of their life. And John, it's good to have you back. Oh, good to see good you, Bob. To, good Thanks good for having me. The Bible doesn't really, I mean, there are all of these interpretations of the Bible. Some of them go back to the original, the original text and, 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 and bring it forward. Others have interpreted those things. Does the Bible really mean what it says? Can we take it literally? You know, I, I just take it literally by a leap of faith. Yeah. Okay. That's one of the things it teaches us. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I just, I, you know, it, and, and that's kind of back to that mm -hmm. childhood faith thing. Mm -hmm. I just, you either believe or you don't. Right. It, it comes and down to that yep. simple of a choice. Yep. And if you choose to believe, you believe all of it. Mm -hmm. and, and and so, yeah, I, I do, I mean, I take it literally, but I also understand that I'm not a Bible scholar, mm -hmm. never professed to be. And so I trust on conversations that I have, I'll ask questions. Mm -hmm. I'll say, what does this mean, pastor or minister? I, I, I always am yeah. I'm inquisitive about these kinds of things. So I just ask questions and I trust that God will give me the right answer. Yeah. I mean, you've got a, a Prelude Publishing is, is now has the first hour for men and it's a 30 day challenge. Yes, sir. To really get in, you, you say by the end of this challenge, you're gonna have, you would have, will have gone through the, the New Testament. The entire New Testament. The entire and you'll end up reading four pages back and front. So it's about eight pages of reading per day. Uh, this book really, it's a workbook more than a book. Right. There's, there's it's, really, it's not a, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's, it's a, a guide. It, it's yeah. literally labeled day one through 30. And each mm -hmm. day there's a list of tasks mm -hmm. that you need to complete. One of those tasks is obviously spending your time with the Lord, praying, giving your first fruits. Uh, putting on your armor, mm -hmm. you know, things like that, spending time with your family, but also time in the Word. And you're going to read a certain amount each day uh, as part mm -hmm. of your exercises to get through right. day one through 30. Uh, morning prayers, 30 minutes, Bible reading, 30 minutes, and it gives you the, it gives you the scriptures to be, to be reading. And sure. then physically work out to That's keep right. the temple of the Holy Spirit. Spend keep time your body, with your family. Keep the Bible. And then you, it says the actions return home anticipating spending time with your children That's and your right. wife and so yeah. it, it does get you into a 30-day discipline there's a structure yeah. right so we're, any we're, guarantees oh i i guarantee <laughs> I, I guarantee you one thing yeah god shows up god shows up. god shows up and let me just say one other thing the way that that structure is broken down remember when we say give your first fruits mm -hmm. we're, we're asking you to give an hour okay yeah. we're not asking you to give three four five a lot of people say well i've got commitments i gotta get to work i gotta do this i gotta do that we're asking you to get up an, an hour earlier mm -hmm. for 30 days. Yeah. At the end of that 30 days, if nothing's changed, well, then you go back to your old way. If somebody promised okay. me a brand new car, if I got up an hour, hour early every day for 30 days, I'd do it. That's right. They're going to give me something. Yes. You've you got some guarantees in this. But my, it's, it, takes, it takes discipline. Yeah, my guarantee is that God shows up and that it's powerful. Today you may have heard some viewpoints different than you've ever heard from your friends, family, or even the church. Well, the point of our program is to have our guests explain their opinions based on their experiences and their faith. One thing we want to be clear about is that we believe the Bible is the Word of God. The Bible says that people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Well, we hope this program gives you a bit more insight into what the Bible says and that it's relevant for your life today. If you want to know more or watch other interviews on demand, go to our webpage or our Facebook page.